to the HOWASP AppSec Europe 2016. Thank you very much for coming. Here, just a few information regarding the conference. So, again, welcome to Rome, and please use this hashtag, AppSecU, for your Twitter. Some information regard, regarding the venue. We are here in the plenary sessions, and we take uh, all the uh, keynote sessions. Then we will have uh, four rooms for the talks. The A room is behind there, and this, this B, C, D room are on the other side of the hotel. Then we will have uh, uh, the um, lunch here, so in, in this uh, area, and then in the expo area that is here, we will have a coffee break, and uh, we will have uh, the lighting training here, so the hell is a lighting training, and the one and two is the capture the flag and activities. So here is the Italian menu for you. Now we will have Charlie Miller of Uber that will uh, be the first keynote of the conference. Then we will have Alessandro Perilli that uh, will be the closing keynote and my quest of Google uh, tomorrow morning. Regarding the schedule, we, we had uh, 138 submissions, and here are the selected talks. And there are three changes in the program. So the first one is that Simone Onofri will talk at uh, 11.35 today, not uh, tomorrow. And then also Lisbeth Kempen will be uh, tomorrow at 11.35, and uh, Jackie Fox also tomorrow at a quarter past four. So these are the three changes of the program. Regarding the lighting training, we have five lighting training of one hour each that you can uh, listen in the other side of the hotel. Regarding the capture the flag, uh, it, it will open at uh, 30 past 10 and uh, you can participate. And, yeah, and also this uh, will be in the other area of the hotel. Tonight, we will have a fantastic social dinner in the Cinecita Studios, that is the Italian Hollywood <laughs> Studios. So buses will wait you at, nine, at 7 p.m. outside the, the conference, so turn left and you will see eight buses that will wait for you. And we will uh, go to the Cinecita Studios to take a fantastic dinner and uh, then at a quarter to 11 p.m. we will leave Cinecita and we will we'll return here. Regarding the expo area, we have also the OWASP uh, store. So there you can find t-shirts, uh, bags, mugs, and so on. And you can uh, have a, a lovely uh, souvenir. So, Bart. So, good morning, everybody. Um, our sponsors, important message. So, this conference wouldn't have been possible without our sponsors. So, please, they're all listed here. D uh, pay them due respect, and they'll, they have a, lo a lot of boots outside. Visit those boots, please, and, and go talk to them. We have a, a passport program, so you all have a card in your bag. Whenever you visit the booth of the sponsor, you will get a stamp, and if your entire card is filled, you can give us that, the card back, and we will pick a, pick a card of those to get, a, to get a prize. The prize is still a surprise. We're not going to announce what it is, but it will be worth it. So please pay respect to the sponsors. We need them to have these conferences. So we all have received these uh, lanyards and badges. Please wear your badges. Uh, it's important for the rest of us to know who you are. Uh, and also that we can see who is, who is taking dinner and, and, uh, and lunch and these kind of things. So please always wear your badges. And I think that's about it for the practical arrangements, practical information. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Charlie Miller. Um, for those of you who wouldn't know him, he's one of the very few uh, high-impact hackers on the planet that um, continues to deliver a lot of uh, very important uh, vulnerabilities out there. Um, who, who finds out these important vulnerabilities. He's probably most known for his uh, work on Apple hacks 
where he was able to uh, um, find vulnerabilities in, in, in different number of num different number of uh, Apple devices, as well as the car hacking that it hit um, over the past the past few years. I remember seeing pictures of cars uh, ending up in ditches uh, because of those experiments. Um, he actually received a number of uh, uh, four, I guess, if that's correct, point to own um, awards for for all of his uh, great work in that. He has a PhD in uh, mathematics and has been working for companies like NSA and, and Twitter. Recently moved to Uber about, about a year ago, where he's uh, the principal security engineer. Too, too bad for all of us. So it will be much more harder to, uh, to find something in there. Um, and, and he will be talking today about uh, some of the very neat vulnerabilities that he has found um, and, and the way he discovered them and what's the impact of these vulnerabilities. So please all give a warm applause to Charlie, and um, let's welcome him. Okay, oh, there we go. So thanks for the introduction, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna talk to you about, um, I've been basically a, a bug hunter, someone who finds bugs for my whole career, which has been, been too long. And uh, I just wanna tell you sort of uh, what motivates me, like why I look for the bugs I look for, some of my favorite bugs and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, Without further ado, I'll jump into this. So th this is more about me. I think it was covering the introduction. Um, yeah, I've been my whole career. I've kind of been moving towards uh, things that are that are easy. So I don't want to spend time working on hard problems. So I, I, I worked on I guess Apple for a while, um, and you know back in so long ago that that people said that you couldn't have vulnerabilities or, or you know viruses or anything on on Macs, and of course they were wrong. Um, so I worked on that for a while, and then they got good or better. Uh, so then I switched to like phones, and then that got better, and then I switched to other stuff like cars, and they still haven't quite gotten better yet. So uh, that's where I'm at for now. Yep, so I already mentioned I'm going to talk about just some bugs and some exploits that I've written that I think are kind of interesting. So so why bugs? And also like I'll, I'll point out that I, I really only know about native code bugs. So I know most people in this room probably are, are more used to web app bugs. Uh, I'm not qualified to talk about that, so I'll talk about what I know, which is native code bugs. So one of the reasons I think that like bugs are interesting is in the like what I call the pyramid of badness. Uh, bugs are kind of the bottom, right? So um, without vulnerabilities, uh, you know, you can't really write exploits, and without exploits, you don't, you know, or there's other ways you can get code on, onto machines, but you know the way that I think is the most interesting is through exploitation. So that's when you get like code, and then you get you know APTs or whatever you want to call it. But, but it all kind of starts from vulnerabilities. Like if we knew how to write software that didn't have vulnerabilities, we would have way less problems in the world. Although all of us would probably be unemployed, so it's for the best. All right, so so what do I do uh, to to find bugs? Well, um, given enough time, this is basically uh, the choice I make. So I, I have to try to figure out what application audits. This is something that if you work you know, for a company and you're in charge of their security, you don't really get that choice. You have to 
find vulnerabilities in, in your company's product. But if you're a freelancing kind of researcher like I am sometimes, that's one of the most important things is what are you going to choose to look, look for bugs in. Um, and then I use you know, some sort of analysis to do it. Uh, I look in at, at some stuff. I'll talk more about this later. Um, and then finally, uh, you know, I, I get around to, to talking about tools. All right. Um, so, like, why do I choose? Like, why did I, I I look at say Safari, or why did I which portion of Safari did I look at, or why did I choose iPhone, or why did I choose to look at look at Android phones? So, um, so, so some of the things you want to look for as you know, and, and this might be helpful for you if you're wondering, like, why is this hacker picking on my company? Why is, uh, why are the these like white hat people in our bug bounty program looking at our application or not? So this is kind of the thought process that I go through when I'm trying to decide what to look for bugs in. So um, basically, like, how distributed is the software? How hard is it going to be? Um, and that sort of thing. So, so like, one of the first things I look at is is you know how distributed it is. So like, if I it, there's, there's sort of this, this dichotomy where there's some software that is widely distributed, like uh, Microsoft IIS or something, and uh, you know, it's, it's run on a ton of servers. But at the same time, it's going to be really hard to find a bug because Microsoft is pretty good at this. They have a lot of tools. They have a lot of smart people. So you've got something that's widely deployed but hard. And then on the other hand, you might have something that it's some PHP script that you know, five people use in the world. Well. It's probably going to be easy to find a bug in that because no one really cared to look at it. Um, but then the impact is going to be really small because who cares if you find a bug in that, right? So like I've always tried to try to find this middle ground where it's software that is uh, you know widely deployed but still maybe a little soft, like hasn't gone through as rigorous of uh, testing as something else. All right, another thing you want to think about is. Uh, how hard is it going to be to actually exploit the software, right? So, like, if if you, if you're just looking for bugs to fix in your own software, that's one story. But if you want to actually write exploits to, you know, to to demonstrate uh, the vulnerability, then you have to worry about that. So, you know, does the target platform have, uh, you know, memory randomization? It's like, like I, I'm not going to talk about this talk, but I wrote an exploit once that was uh, over SMS for iPhones, and that was really hard because. You know, you're sending 140 characters, right? Um, as opposed to something like, uh, you know, against a web browser where you you have a whole scripting language at your disposal that you can use to try to, you know, manage, massage the heap and uh, and do the exploit that way. So that's really hard. And then there's other things to consider, like, uh, you know, obviously if you find a bug in a web server, you're going to have, there, there's going to be a lot more of those exposed and maybe find a bug in some sort of service that's typically firewalled off. Um, so, so there's lots of these things that go into you know, my mind um, when I'm thinking about it. The other one is just like, what's the, you know, what's the history of this? Is, there, is every month, are there new vulnerabilities in this product? Or is it something that there hasn't been a vulnerability in this product found in 10 years, right? So. You know, we don't really know how to measure security. We don't know how to measure which software is the most secure. Um, but we can at least kind of take some, some guesses based on those kind of facts. All right, so I pick a piece of software uh, that I want to analyze and try to find vulnerabilities in. So then what do I do? Well, I, I definitely don't sit around trying to think up new techniques to find bugs, because there really aren't any, right? So like, given enough time and effort, we know how to find a bunch of bugs, right? It's not like, uh, you know, there, there's not really new ideas. It's just a matter of, of putting the time and, and energy into doing it. Um, so, like, you know, one, there's, there's basically two, two approaches that, are, that people use. One is static, which I'm, by which I mean, like, you're using a tool that looks at maybe a binary, or you're just looking at the binary yourself or you uh, are reading the source code or whatever. It's, it's, uh, you, you're not necessarily running the program, you're just looking at it. And so that's what I mean when I say stack analysis. So uh, this is like you know, the way that, that people did this for, for a very long time um, before we really had decent tools. But it's not perfect, of course. And you know, a lot of the commercial offerings have, have these types of problems. And so. Um, 
basically, like, if it comes down to a tool, it can do certain things, but as someone who's, it, it finds bugs, right, and we can fix them, but then the, it's not gonna find any more, right? There's limits to what that tool can do. Um, and then as a person, like, it doesn't scale well. Um, if I'm looking at source code, right, there's not 20 of me looking at source code, there's just me. Um, and it's the same for the team I work on at work, right? So I, I'm there, you know, we've got a couple other guys, but we can't hire 100 people to, to do that. It just doesn't make sense. So it doesn't scale well. And then another thing that's really annoying for me is, uh, you know, maybe I look at code for a week. Um, so this used to happen when I, when I would work at Twitter. So one of my jobs there was to, like, audit code. Uh, so I would look at code for a week, and, you know, yeah, sometimes I would find bugs, but sometimes I wouldn't find any bugs for a week, right? And then it would come time to go to the stand-up meeting and say what we did that week, and I would say, I looked for bugs, but I didn't find any, right? And that's very similar to what I would say had I been on vacation. <laughs> so it's, there's no, not a good way to measure your progress when you're reading source code looking for vulnerabilities, say. So that's sort of disheartening. Um, the other thing is uh, you get, uh, it, you sort of inherently have, this, this problem kind of has, or this piece of code has maybe two issues with it. One is that it shows that reading code is, can be hard, and also tools have problems reading code for this exact reason. So it's like, does this code have a vulnerability? I don't know. Like, you know, there's this like sort of suspicious string copy to a fixed length buffer, which is probably bad, but maybe not, right? It's only bad if you ever call that function with more than 16 bytes of data. Maybe you never do that. Maybe that function never even gets called, right? So like, yes, you know, this looks bad, and if you've ever been on the receiving side of a bug bounty program, you'll get tons of reports that look, you know, like this, right? It's like, this looks bad. It's like, okay, well, show me, show me how it's bad, right? Show me an example input that gets it to be bad, and then they don't know. So anyway, so this is one of the hard things about static analysis is you really need to have a global picture of how the entire piece of software works, but as a human or as a tool, you're kind of restricted to looking at small little bits at a time, and so it's hard to see how it all fits together. Um, one classic uh, example that I really like that shows why stack analysis is really hard and why we have a long way to go is this, this piece of code. So this is from Apache, uh, which is, as you, you know, uh, a web server uh, that has been around for a long time, and it's been like a personal project of mine to find bugs in it. <laughs> So, but I have not really found any good bugs in it. So that's, that's the point, is like, probably in the last 10 years, there have been no, like, real critical vulnerabilities reported in, like, the main Apache web service. There have been in, like, some of the modules, but the main web server itself, there hasn't been, which is good, because if you had a vulnerability, like, an exploitable vulnerability in Apache, you could take over, like, 80% of websites, right? So that would be bad. So anyway, the point is, this is a piece of software that is, like, we should hold up high and say like, they, they did something right here. It's really hard to find bugs in it. And here is like, one of the last bugs that, that they ever found in it. And if you, if you were like, a human being like me, or even a tool reading this code, like, the bug is that this line, PS3 equals node, it's supposed to say PS3 equals active, which is this other guy. It's like, how would you ever see that? Like, you know, you're used to when you see you know, bug reports, it's like, oh, well, they use string copy here. It's like, okay, sure. Or it's like, oh, they read this byte from memory and then they just copied that much data. And it's real obvious, right? But in real life, bugs look like this. They're very subtle, they're very hard to find, and uh, you wouldn't, like, I wouldn't, I could have read that code 100 times and I wouldn't have found that bug. Um, this bug was found with a fuzzer, so, uh, which I'll talk about next. Um, so the other way, if you don't like static analysis, the other way is dynamic analysis or fuzzing. And basically this is just, you keep feeding inputs into a program that are malformed. Uh, you wait and see what the program does, right? So you should be able to send any data you want into a program, and it should handle it, right? It might reject it, it might say this is invalid, but it shouldn't fall over dead, which is what you're basically looking for. And like one of the reasons that fuzzing works is because this particular error might only occur one in a million times, right? So it's extremely rare. But as someone who's fuzzing, you're gonna fuzz with 10 billion iterations, right? And so this, this very rare one in a million event actually happens pretty often. So that's the way you're able to find bugs. The other sort of reasons why it's, it's, it's easy is it scales. 
you don't have to really understand the program. You can just, you know, if you know how to fuzz uh, Safari, you can probably fuzz Internet Explorer with the same kind of tools. You don't have to necessarily understand the code to know how it works. So that's good. The other thing is, if the program crashes, you for sure found an input that, that is bad, right? So it might not be like a security vulnerability, but it's definitely a bug. There's no like real false positives when it comes to fuzzing. So that's some of the good things. Some of the bad things about fuzzing is that, uh, well, it's kind of hard to know, you know, if you won, right? So suppose you fuzz something for a day and you didn't find anything. Does that mean it's, it's good, right? Are, are you done? You, you've, you've secured that software? Or does that mean your fuzzer's broken? Or does that mean your fuzzer just isn't very good? Like, it's kind of hard to know. So that's one of the biggest issues. The other one is, like, when do you turn your fuzzer off? So, like, Microsoft has a rule written into their SDLC that says, I don't remember the exact count, something like, uh, software has to run through 100,000 iterations without failure um, to pass you know, their fuzzer. I don't remember if it's exactly 100,000, but it's some number, right? And so when I read that, I'm like, well, if I'm a tester and I know that's the rule, I'm gonna make a fuzzer that's really bad. That way it's gonna always pass 100,000 iterations and I can move on and write some more software, right? So that, and that's probably not what they intend. So it's, it's, uh, it's hard to know what to do. And, and I used to make fun of that example that Microsoft did because it's like, well, you can't just pick a number. But then I worked somewhere where I had to fuzz our own software and then I was like, huh, I wonder when I should turn the fuzzer off. <laughs> like, when, when did I pass? So it is a problem, and I don't, you know, I don't think anyone really understands the solution of, of like, when to know exactly when you're done fuzzing. Um, so here's some more examples of, uh, of failures of fuzzing. So like, here's just a function I just made up. So in each of these, I made up a function, and I'm going to show you a real function. Uh, that, that there's not really, there's, there's so many different ways different inputs that you would need to test this function that you would never get. So like, there's, there's limits to how much you can fuzz. And there's some, some things that are very complex and you're never gonna be able to get like, good coverage of the program. Here's an example of, of real life when fuzzing failed. So this is a, there was a bug in SendMail and um, SendMail was like a, a mail server. And that used to be very popular. I don't know if people really use it anymore. But in the, in the form, in the field, of the email that was like, you know, uh, a person's name. So it would be like Charlie Miller, Brace, you know, C Miller at OpenRC and Brace, whatever. So like there was a there was a there was a function called crack adder, so like cracking out the address, um, that parsed that out for you. And this function was extremely complicated. So uh, there's 120 different ways through this function. Or, Two to the 120, sorry, that's a little more complicated. Um, so anyway, there, there, there's this function that just has so many conditionals and so many loops, you just, you can't hardly understand how it works, much less uh, fuzz it and test it. So it turned out that the, the particular bug was every time that you made this like open parenthesis, close parenthesis, it like moved a pointer over that, that indicated where the end was, and then every time you put like an open close, uh, um, I don't know, greater than, less than, simple, or whatever you want to call that. It, 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 uh, it, it like, moved it back or something. So they, they basically miscounted, like, the, the opening and closing parentheses. It was really complicated, and somehow you could get it to write past the end of a buffer. And the point is, even when I knew that this was, uh, so, so if you were going to fuzz this with, like, a, a billion different, you know, names with email addresses, different characters, different at symbols, and so forth, the odds that you would have ever made exactly this, open, clo open parentheses, close parentheses, greater than, open, close, greater than, you have, would have had to do that a lot of times in a row, is so slim that you would have probably never found this bug with fuzzing. So this is like the bug, I don't know if you ever see like researchers arguing on Twitter, so I, I argue all the time with Halvar about this particular bug, um, because like this is the bug whenever anyone comes up with a new tool that says like, uh, you know, I have this great new tool. I'm always like, could it find the crack adder bug? Because this is, this is like the most complicated function and like the, the most unique bug. And so that's always the thing. And so like you'll see some people say, uh, yeah, our tool can find the crack adder bug. And then I'll be like, oh, really? They're like, well, it's like a simplified version of it. It's like, no, it doesn't count. So until it can find this bug, I'm not going to buy your tool. All right, so, so these are basically the two main approaches that people take, uh, and myself included. 
um, static and dynamic. And then what, what I do, given enough time, is basically some sort of combination of these two things. So uh, I will start by fuzzing the program. Um, I will look to see like where, uh, you know, I'll look at the code coverage of this test to see which code I've, I've covered. And then I will, I will see what code did I not cover. And then I'll start to, to more closely look at that code statically. And then I'll try to think of ways to make my test cases cover that code. Um, and I'll just keep iterating on that until I understand sort of the more obscure parts of the code, which is where, normally where like, the bug's fine. So, so there's lots of, of reasons why this is a good idea. Mostly because it, it gets you, it, you know, it, like you can't measure where the bugs are, right? If I knew where the bugs were in the software, I would, I'd be done. I wouldn't have to look for it. Um, so, so I guess what it does let you do is it helps you find the parts of the code that no one really understands very well. And that's where you'll likely find some of the bugs. So I'll tell you about a little case study that, where I used this technique and found um, a vulnerability. So uh, this is in Safari. Um, so it's, it's, it's a web browser. Um, if you've ever looked at the source code for WebKit, which is their, um, you know, at least it was, I don't know if it even is anymore, their JavaScript parser. So it's, it's like big, right? You, it's hard to know like where to start looking in this huge pile of code for the vulnerabilities. And so uh, basically what I did was I was like, well, how do, how do the people who run, I mean, this is one of the advantages of like open source software is, is you, can, you can see the people who are developing the code and testing it and what they do. And so I was like, well, how do they test the code, right? And so I found this, this place on their website where they said, um, yeah, this is the way we have this test suite um, for, for WebKit, and before you, you introduce you know, code to us, you should run this test suite. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll run their test suite and see what happens. So I, I set up the web browser to record code coverage. I ran their test suite, and uh, I saw what happened. And what happened was that the test suite covered um, like 60% of the code. Uh, you know, that's pretty good, right? But what, what was important was it didn't cover the code uniformly. So some, this is like a little tool I wrote to try to like help find what code had been covered or not. So uh, you can kind of look and see the, the directories here that some of the code was covered a lot more than other code. In particular, um, so there was a, uh, so the main engine had been covered by 80% of the code, um, but there was this one little part of the code called PCRE, which is their regular expression, um, uh, the code that handles regular expressions, and it was only covered 52%. So like, that, that, that was a clue to me. I was like, well, they've tested the main engine very well, but they haven't tested this little sub bit of code very well. So I'm gonna focus there. So this is just a, a way of, of showing how uh, you know, how do you, how do you find the parts in the code that are possibly weaker than other parts? So I wrote a regular expression fuzzer, and I just started sending it through uh, the browser to see if it would crash. Um, and you can see that, like, you know, if you've ever written regular expressions, they're really complicated. And if you ever write a fuzzer for regular expressions, it's really complicated. And you end up with these very complicated regular expressions. Um, and this is what you, the kinds of things I was seeing whether it could handle. And I ran this fuzzer for, I don't remember, days. And it, no crashes at all. So I was like, huh, I guess my, uh, my approach didn't work. <laughs> but it turns out I looked more closely at the logs, and I started to see these lines. And it was saying things like uh, internal error code overflow. I was like, well, I like the word overflow. So maybe this is something, something important. It didn't crash, but it's reporting some kind of overflow. So I, so I looked. I wanted to look more closely and see those particular ones, what happened. And uh, I, 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 I ran it through something called uh, Purify, um, which is kind of like Valgrind or any of these other tools, electric fence, that you can use to, to, to help you figure out whether um, you know, there's memory problems in your program. And uh, sure enough, when I ran one of these ones that was given this code overflow, there really was uh, a buffer overflow. I don't know if you can read the output of that tool. But this is a tool that tells you exactly where the, the overflow happens, um, exactly where uh, the memory is allocated, and so forth. And so I had found uh, you know, overflows in this PCRE library. So the next question I 
uh, always ask is, well, can you exploit it? And I'll, I'll, yes, you can, of course. I probably wouldn't be talking about it. I'll get to that in, in like 10 minutes if you can hold on. So, so let me talk about some more bugs I found. Um, so I was a consultant for maybe, geez, uh, maybe seven years, a long time. I, so I've worked for many, many companies looking at, you know, my job was basically, I would sit at home, my boss would hand me a big uh, zip file full of source or something, and I would just start reading it and, and finding bugs, right? I did that for a really long time. Um, and uh, I found some real pretty interesting bugs doing that. Uh, some that are like really embarrassing, some that are, are like kind of cool. But anyway, I'll just, I'll just give you a few. This is like one particular program that I looked at that I found all these bugs in. Uh, but I've, I won't tell you whose program it was because that would be, that would be bad. But uh, I've anonymized it a bit so that if, if you wrote this code, uh, you won't be embarrassed. Anyway, so here's, here's uh, it was a little native code server that you would like log into. I don't even remember what its purpose was, but you'd log in and you would like, you know, change some settings or get some files or something. I don't remember what the deal is. Anyway, here's some code that handled uh, the username. So uh, if, if you look for a second, I'll give you a second to look at this, see if you can figure out what the bug is. So um, the bug is like, well, the, the comparison here is a stir end copy, and the length of the comparison is user len. But user len is the link to the thing that the, the user gave you, right? So that means that, like, suppose the, the user's name was Charlie, but you just put, you entered the username of uh, Char, right? So then the length of the comparison is only four, and so that would actually match up with, with Charlie, right? So uh, I wouldn't necessarily have to know the username to, to get it to pass. If you take that to its logical extreme, like, what if I just put in C? for my username. Well, that would still match Charlie. Um, and then uh, instead of trying 26 characters, what if I'd put in, uh, you know, an, an, like a, a string with zero length as my username? That's going to match the very first user that it, it finds, and that really worked in this program. And the very first user was the one that was, like, you know, the administrative user. So for my username, I just say, um, um, uh, you know, I just hit return, basically. And it, it, it accepts me as the, the name of the administrator user. So that's, that's cool. That's the username. But I still need to know their password, right? So here's the code that handled the password. And uh, you guys being experts in web application security, I'm sure you can spot the, the vulnerability here rather quickly. So the, the vulnerability here is a, it's a um, SQL injection. So if you, if you give this, this string as the password, then it passes. So now I know. I don't need to know the username, I don't need to know the password, and I can log in as the administrator. So that's kind of bad. Um, and then, uh, in case that wasn't enough, like, that only lets you log in and do things that you could do when you're logging in. But there's actually a bug that would let you take control of the whole program and run arbitrary code. So here is uh, a line, and this is all just in the, the authentication code, which it was not very much code. Um, so this is, by the way, as a consultant, I love this, right? So. I get some code, I find like two or three bugs in the first five minutes, and then I can just kick back for like a week because like the pressure's off. I basically have fulfilled my assignment as a consultant. The worst is when you get code and you have a week to do it and you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, you can hardly find anything. And it's like you spend, you know, six hours the first day, eight hours the second day, ten hours the third day, like sixteen hours the fourth day until you finally find something. So anyway, these are the good ones. So uh, the vulnerability here, if you haven't figured it out, is if you pass, it's a format string bug. So uh, at least back in the day, uh, now compilers won't, won't really let you do this so much, but back in the day, if you would put in as your username percent %n, it would cause the program to crash. And if you uh, were very, very careful on how you, what username you put in, including some percent %n's, you can actually put, um, do uh, writes into memory. And in theory, you could take over execution of the program. So anyway, so this is, I, I like that example just because it was like, you know, one source file with every bug you could imagine. It was like a perfect tutorial, except it was a real, real life program that people were really using. All right, so, so I like to talk all about the bugs I find, and, and, you know, that makes me feel really good and stuff. But the truth is that I'm not perfect, and I miss bugs all the time. So here is one that I still have nightmares about. So this is, I was hired by a company who, I won't tell you which one, to review some code that was in uh, 
some Samsung phones, and uh, I missed it, right? And then, like, a few weeks later, this news story comes out that is, uh, you get to, basically, here's what the bug was. So there was, I don't remember exactly what it was. There was, like, a character device or something. There was something at the kernel level that would allow you to just essentially read and write to kernel memory. It was, a, it was either a system call or like a, a device or something. I don't know. But it was something really, it was like the simplest bug you can imagine. And uh, someone found it, and you know, they, they wrote APKs that would get you root and all this kind of stuff. It was really bad. And I, I looked at that code. Like, I remember looking at that code. And I, like, I said to myself, I was like, it kind of looks like you could read and write any kernel memory you wanted. I was like, there's no way like, they, they made that mistake, right? Um, but they had. So anyway, I, I feel like really, really bad about this bug. I still think about it. Every time I'm looking at code and I'm like, oh, I don't see anything, I think I'm done. i am like, but remember that time when I missed that bug in Samsung. So I, I okay, I'm gonna look harder. So I'm not perfect, I miss bugs. All right, so what, so let's get back to that, the, uh, that regular expression bug, and I'm gonna show you uh, how I exploited it. Um, because it's, it's interesting because what made it interesting, like writing exploits usually isn't that, that hard, but what made this particular bug interesting to exploit was that this wasn't, this was a while back. So this was in 2007. Um, so back then, and, this, and I was gonna exploit it on the iPhone. So back then, this was like now, if you wanna do research on an iPhone, you jailbreak it, uh, you know, you can SSH into it, you can look around, you can install GDB, whatever. Like it's not hard to do, uh, like exploit development on iPhone. This was right when the iPhone came out, though. So there was no jailbreak. Jailbreaks didn't exist yet. Um, there was no debugger for it. Uh, so the question is, so, okay, I have a vulnerability um, in the iPhone, and, you know, the web browser in the iPhone. Uh, how the heck am I going to write an exploit for it without a debugger? And so that's what made it interesting to me. So uh, the only thing that I could do was I could, I could make it crash, and then I could plug in my phone into my computer, and then I could like sync it with iTunes or whatever, and I could look at the crash dump. That was the only thing I had um, at my disposal. And so what I would do is I just basically fuzzed it. Uh, so I, I mean, I knew the bug. I just took the, the something that would make it crash and just added more stuff around it until, and just looked at the crash reports until I found one that looked kind of good. And the one that I looked at, event, or I, I stuck with, was, was this one. So, uh, so I bet you when you came to the keynote, you didn't think you'd see um, ARM assembly language. But you are. So anyway, uh, this particular crash, it, I'm, I can control something, at, the thing in R3 and the thing in R, R IP, which is R12, is something that I kind of control. And if you've done enough like heap exploitation, you'll recognize what this looks like. <coughs> this is an unlinking operation, which you basically get when um, you're trying to remove something from a linked list, and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, the point is, I, I, I got this, this state where I can make the, um, the phone do something that I think I can make it then write into memory. So there's some work to do, right? So those things in R3 and R12, I think I said, uh, they were, they were I kind of controlled them, but not exactly. So the first thing was to get them completely controlled. So now I have complete control over R3 and R, R IP, they call it. Um, and that was just a matter of finding a regular expression, changing the regular expression to where uh, it, it had whatever I wanted in it. So at that point, then, I can write four bytes anywhere. But again, I don't have a debugger. I don't know where, what to write. Um, it's still kind of difficult. And this is where uh, the lesson is, the layered approach to security is really works. So, you know, you'll hear me say all the time how, how secure iPhones are. And, you know, I have an iPhone in my pocket right now. It's, it's probably the most secure consumer device that any of us have. But this, this isn't the same iPhone. So back when iPhone first came out, it didn't have any, like, security built in at all. So this is just the HTML. If you would take an original iPhone and hit this, your phone would crash. But how do I take that and make it into actually getting control of the code? Okay, well, what I did was, I was like, okay, I'll just start writing. Like, I can tell what the stack is. I don't know what's on the stack. I just know where it is. I'll just start writing different spots on the stack and see what happens. Well, 
I did that, um, and eventually what happened was that, uh, and I was, what value do I write? I was like, well, I'll just write to some other stack value. I don't know what it is. And it wasn't too long before just with this trial and error approach, I got, I could tell that I was actually executing on the stack. It wasn't my code yet. I, that took a little more work. But still, it was like, okay, so why did this work? Like, why was I able to, like, quote, unquote, brute force this exploit? Well, there, the stack location was not randomized, which now it would be. Um, you can execute on the stack, which you can't do anymore. And so because they didn't have any of these, like, layers of, of, of uh, defense built into the platform, I, could, I, it was, I was able to actually exploit the thing without ever having run a debugger on it, which is pretty crazy. And then as far as shell code and all that kind of stuff, I'll, I'll, I'll spare you um, the boredom of that. But basically, I just, uh, again, it was, just, it was hard to debug. But I, uh, I got a cross-compiler, wrote some code, threw it on there. And that was how I exploited the iPhone like when it first came out. Um, all right, so now I'll talk about another iPhone bug that I like. Um, so this is one in uh, iOS 5 code signing. So there's been, um, I think, three code signing bugs that, are in, uh, that have been found in iPhones. The first one I found in iPhone 2, which no one cared about, including myself, because like, code signing wasn't a big deal then. Like, we didn't really even understand what it was back then, believe it or not. Um, there was, like, a long time when myself and some other people were giving talks at research conferences about how to do iPhone exploitation. And the only reason it was working was because we had a jailbroken iPhone that turned off code signing. And it turned out that those same things wouldn't work on a real iPhone. So back then, no one really understood how iPhones worked. Um, but now we do. Um, and by the time iPhone 5 came around, like, we did understand how it worked, and so this was kind of a cool bug. And then there's been like one more since then that I didn't find, some other guys did. Um, but anyway, why is this like a big deal? Because the entire iPhone security basically relies on, on this code signing mechanism. So the way that it works is uh, if you want to get an app for your phone, you, you have to get it from Apple, right? Because it's signed by Apple. Or by, you can include more certificates for like your enterprise or something. But like out of the box, it has to come from Apple. And you're like, okay, cool. That means I can't download it from some you know, Chinese website or something. Uh, so, so, so what? Well, it's not just that you can only download an app and it like checks right before it runs that it's signed. There's like way more, it's way more detailed than that. What it means is that that app, for example, can't um, allocate memory and write code to it and execute it, right? Because that would be code that Apple hadn't checked. It can't download new code and, and execute it. It can't update itself. Um, so, so you can't do anything that has to do with code anywhere in, in, the, in the system that hasn't been checked, signed by Apple. So a, a bug in that particular mechanism is like very sensitive because it breaks the whole kind of uh, security model of, of the iPhone. So here's uh, a function that that has a bug. You can, you can see if you can find it. And um, one of the reasons I, I talk about this bug, and I'll, I'll tell you more in a minute, is because it's like, kind of hard to find, right? So I'll, I'll explain a little bit what, the, what this is. So there's this code, and basically what it says is, like, if you want to have this flag, map JIT. So JIT, just in time compiler, is something like something web browsers do. Like, if, if they have JavaScript they download and they want to execute that really quick, Instead of having to run the JavaScript, because that's kind of slow, it's like it writes it into memory as code, like real native code and runs it. And that makes it faster. But that means that that has, what's it done? Well, it, that, that violates code signing, right? Because this is code that's sort of on the fly that's executing. So that's like a special privilege that normal programs can't do. So it says, if you want to do this just-in-time compiling stuff, then you have to use, uh, then if you have one of these other flags, don't let them do it, right? And it turns out that these other flags is every, every single flag except this, other, this one here. So there's only like one, two, three. There's only four. Or is it three? One, two. There's only four possible flags you can pass. And this checks to make sure it's not one of these three. It's not this one. It's not this one. This one. The only one left is this one. And so down here, it, it checks to make sure that you're allowed to do this operation. 
Okay, so what's the bug then, right? Um, well, the bug is, anyone see it? So in the, in the source code, it's almost impossible to find. And even when I've, I've sort of pointed out, it's even harder in real life because, uh, or did I not even give you enough information? Do, do, do. All right, so, so I left out the one line, which is the key. And now it's there. So what happens, so I found this bug by looking at the binary. In the binary, this bug is, is pretty obvious. But in the source code, like when I went and then found the source code later for this, I was like, oh, look, they fixed it because it's so hard to find. I knew the bug was there, and I didn't see it. So the bug is that they, they define this constant to be zero. They could have defined it to be anything. It was just like an enumerable, right? They just defined it. One was zero, one's one, one's two, one's three, whatever. But what that means is that when you look, when you do your flags and zero, that's always zero. So that doesn't count. So it, it looks like it's checking to make sure that it's not this. But really, that check is like optimized out by the compiler. So it's like super subtle bug. But what that means then is that you can, uh, you can then, I don't know if I have it or not, you can then pass in this, this guy and this guy, and it will pass this check. And that allows you to then execute code that's not signed. It's kind of complicated, but um, it's amazing that the bug is so hard to find um, in source code that I actually thought that they had fixed it when they hadn't. OK. So, so what can do that? Well, it turns out that um, any App Store app could do that. Cool. And here's how you do it. In your App Store app, if you just had this line, it would let you allocate a page of memory that you could write to and then execute code from, which shouldn't be allowed. So um, that's bad, right? So, so that means that, uh, that apps can then download code at runtime that Apple's never seen and run it. So being the responsible researcher, I reported this to Apple. And at the time, I thought I was being really clever because all, I didn't really tell them what the bug was. I wanted them to kind of do some work, and I'd just say, like, I don't think this does what you think it does. Um, and then, like, later on, I worked for a company, and I had to triage a bunch of reports that, that our bug bounty reporters were reporting. And I looked back at this. I was like, man, I was really a jerk. But live and learn, right? But anyway, I thought it was funny. And to their credit, they did find that bug that I reported, even though I didn't report it very well. So, uh, so then what? Um, well, then I, I, I wrote code that, you, that, that leveraged this vulnerability to be able to just download a, a dynamic library and load it, even though it's not signed, which should be impossible because of this bug, you could do it. So I don't know, you might have heard the story, but um, basically I had, by this time, had many run-ins with Apple. And uh, basically I, I, I knew what they were going to say. And what they were going to say is, you're right, Charlie, this is a bug. Um, it's serious, but if you ever would have, if any app would have ever tried to do that, we would have caught it in the review process. And so I was like, well, I know they're going to say that, and so the way that, to get around that is I'm going to submit it in the review process and see if they catch it, right? So I submitted an app uh, to, to, the, to the store. Um, it got accepted. And then I was like, aha, so, so they, they don't catch that, that particular bug. So, I, so I, I reported the bug as well. So the app that I reported, the original app was called the Daily Hoff. Um, so it, the, the actual first app was called the Hoff. And all it is was David Hasselhoff. And uh, you can like zoom in on him infinitely to like more David Hasselhoffs. If you look, you can guess where the zooming takes place in that picture. <laughs> and so they reported to me, uh, sorry, this app doesn't, it's not you know, useful enough or something. And, and so that's why I named it the Daily Hoff, because I was like, aha, it seems like it's not useful. But in this app, every day there's a new picture of David Hasselhoff. And that's why it's like useful. And they still wouldn't let me do it. So the sad thing is it was rejected. Like, like, no one will know how cool this app was, but it does exist, um, but it, was, it never made it to the App Store. But I did introduce this other app called Instastock, which is like a really boring app, and they, they let that one in. Um, at first, I thought I was busted, because I submitted it, and they're like, no, this is rejected for illegal API usage. And I was like, oh, dang, man, they really did catch me, right? Good, well done. But then I looked and saw what they said. They're like, you used add text field with value. I was like, oh, well, I can fix that. That's not a problem. 
they didn't catch the thing where I allocate memory and execute it. So anyway, so I put this in the, uh, the app store for a couple months, and people downloaded it, but it didn't do anything bad. Um, it would phone home to me and try to download uh, you know, a library to load, but I never had that there unless I was testing. So, so lots of people downloaded it. No one actually got exploited for it by it except me and, and like my buddy Chris. So here's what the app looked like in the app store. Uh, it, it did stocks. I don't know, it wasn't very, very complicated. But um, you know, the, the, the short story is that uh, I was out for a run, and um, I came home, and my wife was, so I had given a, done an uh, interview with like Wired Magazine or something about this particular app and, and the problem with code signing and all this kind of stuff. And I get home from my run, and my wife is like, hey, Apple called. I was like, Apple called? Like, they don't, Apple doesn't call me, right? And so, so I called them back, and they're like, oh, so uh, they had apparently read the article, and they, then they found out about the app, and then they got really mad, and they, they were like, hey, uh, um, yeah, we're removing your app from the app store. I was like, okay. And they're like, don't you want to know why? I was like, I, I think I know why. Um, so anyway, they, they removed the app, and, and they, they were really mad about it. But uh, you know, I, in, in, in my defense, like, I found this like, super subtle bug that really like, destroyed their entire uh, security of their, of their platform, and I did that. And yeah, I had a little more fun. But anyway, it, we're all friends now. So, uh, so what, what, what do I want you to take away from this? Basically, it's hard to find vulnerabilities. Um, if we knew how to do that, we would be better, but, but, but it, we don't know how. <laughs> so anyway, it's hard. Uh, I found some. Don't mess with Apple. They'll, they'll, they'll kick you out of their developer program. Um, and uh, that's it. So thank you. We've got a couple minutes. If you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. If not, I will see you guys uh, at dinner. Bye. Thanks.